Ah, let's ah. talk about feature tracking. Look at these two frames and focus on a particular region. Given a key point location x, y at frame t, we want to know where this point goes in the next frame. We want to know the motion vector uv. This is the problem of feature tracking. It's at the core of computer vision and has applications in video stabilization, object tracking, motion analysis, and SLAM. How can we solve this problem? Hmm. We can use a local patch centered around our keyframe as template and find the corresponding patch in the next frame by trying out all possible motions. But this is just too slow. Ah. Ah. Let's see what we can uh. do. We first assume that the intensity of the same point does not change between the two frames. We then assume the motion is small and derive the first order approximation of the intensity using Tyler expansion. We now have our first equation for motion estimation, but we have two unknowns. A single equation only tells us that the motion uv lies on a line, but does not tell us where it is. This is known as the aperture problem. The bubbles pole is an example illustrating such ambiguity. The motion we perceive goes upward, but the true motion is rotating along the z-axis. So, how do we resolve this ambiguity? We can assume that all nearby points move together. This gives us more equations to estimate the motion. Let's rewrite these equations compactly using matrix representation. This is an over-determinate system because we have more equations than the number of unknowns. Applying the A transpose on both sides lead to a normal equation. We can now compute the motion as the least square solution to this over-determined system. Let's visualize the algorithm. From a frame at time t, we compute the x and y derivative using gradient filters. We can compute a temporal derivative using frame difference. We then compute these terms using minimum wise multiplications. Next, we compute the weighted local average using a Gaussian filter. We can now estimate the motion using the least square solution. This is great, but this only works when the motion is very small. Let's talk about two ideas to handle large motion. The first idea is iterative refinement. We denote the point position in the next frame as x plum y plum. Since we don't know where the point goes, we initialize it at the same position x, y at time t, assuming zero motion. With the temporal derivative, we can estimate the motion using our equation. Now we have a better idea of where the point position is in the next frame. We update the position with the estimated motion, recompute the temporal derivative, and estimate the residual motion. We iteratively refine the motion until the residual motion is sufficiently small. This is nice, but still not sufficient to handle large motions. We need a second idea, course to find search. We build a Gaussian pyramid of multiple levels for each image. A large motion in the original resolution is now a tiny motion in low resolution images. We start with the lowest image resolution and estimate the motion using the iterative lucas kanade algorithm. We can update the correspondence using the estimated motion and upscale them to the next level. This provides an accurate initialization for the next level. We repeat this process until we reach the original image resolution. So, this is how the Lucas Candidate Tracking Algorithm works. It's simple, intuitive, and works very well in practice. Wow. I want to end this video with a clip of Takeo Kanade sharing an inspiring story about this paper. Here's one story. There's a problem in vision called tracking problem. Here's one pattern in the first frame, and it, it, the task is to know how much it moved in the second frame. It's called tracking problem. So the task is to get that value u, vector u, two numbers, u and v, you know, horizontal and vertical movement. It's a very basic problem, and the simplest solution idea is make a small window and search in the next window and to see whether there's a same pattern. And that can be summarized as, um, as gx, which is the small window, minus fx difference of fx plus u. u is the shift view. And you make the difference, compute the difference between each individual pixel and square them, square the difference and sum over the window. And then if the two patterns are exactly the same, that should be zero. Therefore, the correct answer should be U that minimize this error, okay? Now, this is a fundamental problem. 
And the, the easiest way to do is you compute that EU for all possible U and, and then decide which U will give the minimum. Okay? But it takes time, even when the computer is fast. And this is a very important problem, and we're working on it in the early 80s. And my students, Bruce Lucas, came to me. Takeo, we got a, I got a good idea. And I asked him, what is it? And he said, well, you know, you, which is a movement, usually is small. Therefore, we should use Taylor expansion of fx plus u, and then if you use only the first term, then fx, f parenthesis x plus u is fx plus derivative of f times this small displacement u. Then now you see u, which is unknown, comes out of that function f, and if you put that fx plus u substitute in the original one, then eu now becomes a quadratic, fun quadratic function of u. Now we know minimum or quadratic function is here, which is computable. Even high school students can do. Now, of course, we are talking two dimensions, so it's a little more complicated, but you can get explicit. This, is, this should work, Bruce said. We should write a paper, he said. I said, no, I don't want that. And Bruce asked, why? I said, Bruce, this is not new, you see. Newness, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was thinking new is important. This is not new. You know, Taylor expansion has been known 300 years. This is not new. And what you did is the derivation, that's high school student can do. And I don't want to write a paper on a Taylor expansion and derivation, which high school students can do, and then my reputation will go down. You should not write a paper. And Bruce was very persistent. I should write it. We should write a paper. So I told him, okay, you can write a paper. But make sure you write a paper in a very obscure place so that nobody would read it. <laughs> and indeed, we wrote a paper, and we never published any journal paper, never. Guess what? That paper turns out to be the most cited paper of my whole life. <laughs> Indeed, more than 10,000, uh, probably more, citing. The biggest cited paper. And if Bruce listened to me, I think Takeo Kanade today did not exist, I think. So since then, I always tell students, what your professor says is probably wrong. <laughs> so don't listen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.